Wondery Plus subscribers can listen to I Hear Fear early and ad-free. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. I don't get why you're dragging us here. Huh. It's going to be lit. You'll see. Look, there it is. How do you know? Look where I'm shining the flashlight, stupid. Every teenager in Delmont knows this tree. Right where the trunk starts splitting into branches, there's a man-sized lump. It looks like a climber got stuck there, and the bark grew right over him. Just under the lump, there's a gash in the tree that oozes black sap. People say it's Pete's blood still trickling out. Almost 50 years ago, on October 12th, 1972, a total loser became a legend. Hey, keep it down. You want the cops to come? You're just afraid Climbing Pete's gonna hear us. <laughs> Campbell is the resident jerk in my class. Ever since freshman year, he's decided it was his job to torment me and my friend Eric. We mostly suck it up, like tonight, when he said we had to tag along with him on this little outing. Stop being such a tool, Campbell. Leave him alone. That's my boy, Eric. He always sticks up for me. Chill, bro. Everybody ready for the chant? I glance over at Eric. He shrugs. Uh, sure. Yeah, let, let's get this over with. Climbing Pete lost his mind. Climbing Pete lost his mind. The highest tree he did find. Climbed the highest he could go. Through his eyes, green shoots did grow. The rumor is, if you chant the lines and start climbing a tree, it's just a matter of time before Pete gets you. You want to climb as high as you can, and Pete will be up there, waiting. Everyone chants but me. I just mouth along. Okay, time to spin the bottle. Whoever it lands on climbs. All the way up to Pete. And we have a winner! My stomach drops. The bottle is pointed at me. Uh, I, I think you've got to spin it again. It, it's halfway between me and Eric. We don't do second spins. One of you needs to start climbing now. Or I start smashing both your faces with this bottle. I look at Eric. He's the only one who knows I'm terrified of heights. <sighs> Alright, I'll go. No big deal. It's just a tree, right? I'm sorry, dude. I It's okay. Give the man a hand. Somebody gives Eric a boost to the first branch. I hear a gasp of breath as he fights to reach the next limb. And then he's gone. Ah! You all right, Eric? Do you need help? My heart is racing. If he falls, it's all on me. Like you're going anywhere, you jackass. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Just a little slip. Uh, I'm, I'm okay. Eric keeps climbing. After a few minutes, I lose sight of his neon blue shirt. His movement grows distant. And then it's gone. Eric, you there? Climbing Pete got him. Or he crapped his pants and he's too embarrassed to come down. <laughs> <laughs> Minutes pass. Nothing. Okay, I'm out of here. Hey, Avery, maybe you need to run to the drugstore and get some diapers for Eric. <laughs> Eric, they're all gone. You can come down now. I turn on my phone's flashlight. The light's weak, but I shine it at the tree. I move the light up the trunk. Higher, higher. I don't see Pete's lump. I thought it was right there. This isn't funny anymore, okay? I'm leaving. You hear me? I'm out of here. But I stay. 
It's nearly 3 a.m. when I walk away. I don't get it. What's Eric trying to prove? Moving through the forest is slow work. I keep my phone's flashlight aimed at the dense brush ahead of me. It's Eric's number. Eric, you better tell me where the hell you are. From Amazon Music and Wondery, I'm Carrie Mulligan, and this is I Hear Fear. If I had to pick the two scariest experiences in my life, I'd say one, watching the Blair Witch Project when I was only 12 or 13 years old, and two, having to recreate the Blair Witch Project for a class assignment in high school. I want you to imagine it. Our teachers actually took us on a camping trip, had us set up tents, and then left us alone with just our video cameras. I remember shivering in my tent, listening to the sounds of the forest, and feeling certain that every time a branch snapped, it was the witch taking one more step toward my tent. Looking back, it was a bit sadistic of our teachers, wasn't it? But I suppose it could have been worse. Our teachers could have taken us to a forest that was actually haunted, of which there's a very long list. Yosemite Park has the Chill Newell the Falls Trail, which is supposed to be a lovely hike, until the waterfall near the end. That's where you might hear the screams of a drowning child, and any hiker foolish enough to wade in and try and help him will be pulled under. And then there's Freetown Fall River State Forest. It's known as the Cursed Forest of Massachusetts. 5,000 acres of twisting paths and towering trees. Visitors say they've seen spirits of indigenous victims from a 17th century war weaving through the trees. Older legends have told of bizarre, human-like creatures that stalk the woods. It's the kind of place where you don't want to be once the sun goes down. It's all a reminder that, sure, nature can be where you go to get away from it all, but if you're not careful, it's also where you could disappear forever. Which takes us to episode three, Climbing Pete. Tired of ads interrupting your gripping investigations? Good news! Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Ads shouldn't be the scariest thing about true crime podcasts. To start listening, download the Amazon Music app or visit amazon.com slash true crime ad free. That's amazon.com slash true crime ad free to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Journalist Tristan Redman is going where no son-in-law should ever go, deep into his wife's family history, digging up the cold case of her murdered great-grandmother. Ghost Story is a podcast about family secrets, overwhelming coincidence, and the things that come back to haunt us. Stay tuned to the end of this episode to hear a preview of Ghost Story. Only drunks like my dad snore like that. And only another drunk, like my mom, could sleep through it. I'm making breakfast for me and my younger sister, Joe. Frozen waffles and instant coffee. Same as always. Why do you always get the blueberry waffles? Because they're always the ones on sale. I don't want any. You can eat them. Joe's usually a chatterbox, chirping about her art projects and her plans for the day. But the past couple days, something's changed. If she talks at all, it's usually to say something sarcastic. I'd worry about her, but I'm more worried about Eric. I must have sent that guy 20 texts and still no response. That message I got from my phone scared the pants off of me. But then it pissed me off. Why would he mess with me like that? So what happened last night? 
I heard you creeping in. I give her the short version and try not to sound too freaked out. I don't want my 14-year-old sister having nightmares. Joe may like to pretend she's grown up, but she still sleeps with her old teddy bear. So Eric's still up in that tree? Or, more likely, he's at home. And the joke's on us. Some kids in my class were talking about climbing Pete yesterday. They were daring each other to go into the forest and do the chant. It sounded kind of fun. Yeah, really fun. Okay, pack your stuff. We need to get to school. We can stop by Eric's on the way, okay? I pull Joe close as we pass 289 Laurel Street, which looks like every other ranch-style house on the block, except for the boarded-up windows and chipped white paint. No one has lived here for 50 years. This was once the home of Climbing Pete. According to the legend, an unemployed mill worker named Pete Stamford murdered his wife and her brother before vanishing into the woods. It was a bit of a mystery why he did what he did, but a neighbor said she'd seen him go into the woods a lot after he lost his job. That's where his brother-in-law found him one day, and that's when Pete cut his throat from ear to ear. Then he went home and did the same thing to his wife. Four days later, the cops found Pete in a tree, the one Eric climbed. But it wasn't Pete anymore, not really. He'd become part of the tree. The only part of him that was still visible was a hand reaching for a higher branch. The cops weren't sure if he was still alive. One cop claimed he saw a finger twitch. Well, that's how the legend goes. Since then, any time someone goes missing, people whisper it's climbing Pete. Eric's house is more cheery than the one Pete lived in, even though his dad lost his job too. Eric's dad opens the door, jamming his knee against it to keep his terrier inside. When I ask to see Eric, he tells me he's not there. Says when I do see him, to tell him he's in big trouble because he never came home. Maybe he's at school already? Joe looks at me funny. What is she thinking? But I know better than to ask. She'll just roll her eyes. I let her walk ahead of me. She's wearing her favorite jacket, a beat-up leather bomber. I bought it for myself, but ended up giving it to her. The jacket swallows her whole. Did you even climb the tree to see if he was up there? I've never told Joe that I'm scared of heights, and I never plan to. I want her to think I'm strong enough to protect her. So I say nothing. My friend taught me the climbing Pete chant. You want to hear it? No, I, I don't want to hear it. And I never want you to say it. Because you think he's real? No, because it's stupid. What's that? It's coming from the forest. At the edge, high up in the trees, I see something move. Something big and fast. Joe sees it too, and before I can stop her, she's stepping off the curb. Joe, look out! What the hell? Don't go over there! I'm sorry, but what was that? Just walk. I look up again, but it's gone. On the wall, next to the entrance of the school, Campbell is waiting as usual. He's in no hurry to be on time for classes when he and his friends will need summer school anyway. I squeeze Joe's hand and tell her to go on ahead, but Campbell stops us. Hey, little sis, you scared? I'm not scared of anything. How about you meet us after school? We need to borrow you for a little sacrificial offering. Climbing Pete is coming to get you. Leave her alone, or I'm going to hurt you. Sure you will. The punch I throw misses him completely. Campbell and his buddies have me on the ground in three seconds flat. One of them holds me down, and Campbell takes a free shot, because that's just the kind of guy he is. Tell her you're a chicken shit, or I'll stomp on your head. I picture myself breaking free, 
the feel of my fist connecting with his head, but I can't move an inch. I have no choice. I'm a chicken shit. When I look up, I see Joe is giving me the saddest look I've seen in a long, long time. My whole brave big brother act falling apart everywhere. So, did you and your buddy Eric hide in the tree so you could play kissy kiss after we left? He never climbed down. Campbell looks over at his friends, like a dim idea is forming in this Neanderthal brain. Something epic. If chicken shit is telling the truth, this could mean badass Pete might seriously be back. And he's got his first victim. But if you two are messing with us, we'll tie the both of you to that tree and leave you there until the squirrels chew your nuts off. I race to my classroom. Eric's desk sits empty. I'm officially terrified. There's only one thing I can do. As soon as classes are over, I need to head back into the woods to look for him myself. After school, I walk Joe home in silence. I don't want to tell her where I'm going after I drop her off. She nags me the whole way. I still don't understand how you could just leave Eric in the woods. I didn't just leave him, okay? I I told you. I climbed the tree, and I, I couldn't find him. And, and then I waited until I couldn't wait anymore. I know you didn't climb the tree. You can't even climb a ladder. You're a liar and a chicken shit. And you abandon everyone. I saw the college essay you left on your desk. Really great reading how horrible your family life is and how lucky you'd be to escape it. You didn't even mention me. It's like I don't exist. It's just stuff you say to get into college. I didn't mean it like that. Nothing you say is true. You don't care about any of us. Joe's face is splotchy red. I step toward her to hug her, but she squirms away. Don't follow me. Joe, where are you going? I'm just going home. I need to get used to being there by myself. I watch her walk away. She's in her oversized bomber jacket, which just makes her look smaller. When I start walking again, I kick every pebble I can find. It doesn't make me feel any better. 20 minutes later, I'm back where I was last night. I turn in circles, looking for the lump that marks climbing Pete's tree. I can't find it. But then, a flash of white catches my eye. It's on the ground. A single white Converse sneaker. I'd recognize Eric's shoe anywhere. And then I see something else. His cell phone. The screen is cracked. I pick up the phone and enter his lazy 1234 password. And there's a video. I hit play. Okay, I'm not sure what it is, but something is moving around up above me. What the hell is up there? It's hard to know, but I I, I see something. This is beginning to totally freak me out. What was that? Raccoon. Okay, I guess I'm high enough. I'll just, uh, I'll just wait here for ten minutes and then climb back down. Avery, you better still be there. Oh my god. What's that? Is, is that a hand? Oh god. It's, it's reaching. the phone into my pocket. What was up there? I'm still reeling from what I saw in Eric's phone. When something rustles behind me. I turn, look around. I'm half expecting to find Campbell with his meathead crew. But there's no one there. Not a soul. 
All I see is a small brown bird flying from branch to branch. It's sitting just a few feet away from me, cocking its head to the left and to the right. And then it starts singing. The whole forest is filled with bird cries, like a thousand birds had their brains rewired at the same instant. To warn me? To flush me out? I hear something in the distance, coming closer. Whatever's happening, it can't be good. I start running. The edge of the forest is only a quarter mile away. Whatever's chasing me, it's in the trees. I need to keep my eyes on the ground so I don't lose my footing. But I steal a look up. Dark figure blots out the sky and lands on the tree right above me. Holy shit! I try to run faster, but the creature keeps pace with me. Every time it lands on a new tree, an explosion of twigs sprays down around me. But the trees are thinning out. The edge of the forest is in sight. I pump my arms as hard as I can. The creature's swinging lower and lower. It's getting so close to me, I can feel the wind in the air when it swings. And then something grazes my shoulder. It takes another swing and grabs a handful of my shirt. I tumble down face first and quickly roll over. It's in a low tree branch right above me. I don't know what I'm looking at. It's not a man, but it's shaped like one. The skin on his face is spongy like a mushroom cap. He smiles at me, and a caterpillar drips out of his mouth and lands on my hand. And then... He reaches for me. His jagged gray fingernails graze the air six inches above my face. I start crawling backwards, my eyes locked on him. He stays on the lowest branch, just watching me. He doesn't make another move. I crawl backwards like my life depends on it until I can't see it anymore and there aren't any trees above me. I'm in the field between the forest and my high school. In all the versions of the Climbing Pete story that I've heard over the years, he can't attack you if you're out of the forest. But I don't take any chances. I roll over, stand up, and run. The sun's already setting when I walk up my driveway. I took a detour to the police station on my way back. When I told the desk sergeant that my friend climbed a tree and never came down, the guy just laughed at me. He told me that every year around this time, they get reports just like this. I, I pushed Eric's phone at him, showed him the video, but he said he'd seen pranks like this before. He slid the phone back and said I should put the video on TikTok. Maybe it would go viral. I finally walk through the front door, but Joe doesn't look up. She's curled up on her grimy couch texting on her phone. When I get nearer, she pulls her knees closer. Everything about her body language says, I still hate you. Is mom at work? Yeah. And dad? Who knows? Lenny's tavern, probably. Why is your phone blowing up? Campbell's throwing a party or something. He wants to go flush out climbing Pete. The blood drains from my face. I grab the phone straight from her hands. What the hell? I scroll up. Lots of fire emojis, devil emojis. I keep scrolling, reading. The party's gonna start at the bridge, down by Baylor Creek, and then Campbell's gonna lead everyone into the woods. He's promised them a climbing Pete sighting? This guy's insane. He's gonna get everyone killed. Give me my phone back. Joe, you're not going to this. Everyone's going. I'm serious. Look, I, I know I messed up, and I know that you hate me right now, but I can't let you go. Yeah? How are you going to stop me? She lunges for her phone again, and I grab her by her waist and lift her. Get off me! I carry her down the hallway, through the bedroom, and finally set Joe down, feet first, in her closet. What are you doing? 
have to work quick. I hold the doorknob with one hand and pull her desk chair toward me with the other. And then I wedge the chair under the doorknob. I'm so sorry, Joe. I'm doing this because it's still my job to protect you. Climbing Pete is real. I saw him with my own eyes. It's not safe for you out there. You're a psycho. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Her screams make me feel like I'm a terrible person, but I'm getting used to that feeling. I grab a sweater from my room and a flashlight from the kitchen. Outside the kitchen window, the last streak of orange in the sky disappears. I'm already running out of time. As I get closer to the bridge, I start to let myself feel a tiny glimmer of hope. I don't hear too many voices. Maybe the party's gonna be small. I count the shapes of about a dozen kids milling around. In the fading light, it's hard to see their faces. I prick my ears for Campbell's evil pig laugh but I don't hear it. Yo, have you seen Campbell? Um, he was here. I don't know, I haven't seen him lately. Is, uh, is Campbell here? You missed him by like 10 minutes. He just took a bunch of freshmen to the woods. Crap, thanks. I turn to go, then have a second thought. Hey, if I were you, I'd split. I heard the cops are coming. I walk as fast as I can. And then when I can't hear the party anymore, I break into a sprint. I switch on my flashlight, but it only makes the forest feel darker. The beam is so little, and the forest is so large. It's like using a butter knife to cut through steak. But then, I hear something in the distance. follow the sound of the chanting. It gets closer and closer until it's coming from all around me. I swing my flashlight in a wild circle around me, but I don't see anything. Ah! I jump back. A hand swings at me again. I crouch low and aim my flashlight up. My beam finds Campbell's face in the branch above me. Avery, is that you? His pupils are dilated. His skin is pale and sweaty. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm scared. I'm so, so, so scared. Everyone else is gone. What do you mean they're gone? They all they kept climbing. Campbell, you need to come down now, okay? You have to help me find them. I can't. The tree wants me to keep climbing. Here, grab my hand. Campbell shifts his weight on the branch like he's going to take my hand. I'll help you down, please. But then he leans against the trunk, stands up, and reaches for a higher branch. Campbell, don't do it. Climbing Pete lost his mind. The highest tree. He climbs higher and swings for another branch. For a moment, I think he's gonna fall. But then I see something else moving in the tree. Something from up above snaking out of the shadows. A branch. It curls around his foot and drags him up inch by inch. Other branches begin to fall from above. Thin tentacles with wispy leaves stretching toward him. One by one, they wrap around him. I'm watching Campbell get smaller the higher up he goes. He's here now, climbing Pete. I can hear him jumping from tree to tree right above me. I whip my flashlight around, but I'm not quick enough to catch him. Instead, My flashlight catches items the climbing kids have left behind. A frayed baseball cap, a shiny Pokemon backpack, a red cardigan. And then my flashlight lands on something I'd recognize anywhere, even halfway up a tree. My sister's bomber jacket.
Joe? Joe! Joe! I know which tree this is. This is climbing Pete's tree. The one that Eric disappeared in. I look toward the top of the maple, hoping I can see something. But just looking up makes me dizzy. I think I'm going to be sick. But I can't chicken out. And I don't have Eric to climb in my place. It's just me and my little sister, who's somewhere up this tree. I jump for the closest branch, and as I catch it, I brace my foot against the trunk. I push with my foot and swing myself up. I get one leg around the branch, and then another. I thought once I was climbing, the tree would make it easier. But then I remember, I never said the chant. Even last night, when everyone else was saying it, I didn't chant a single word. That's why I'm not under Pete's spell. And that's why the tree is not helping me. I'll have to do this the hard way. I keep climbing. Once in a while, I look up for signs of Joe, but then the vertigo hits and I need to close my eyes and breathe. It's hard to know how high I've gotten, but the branches keep getting more dense. It's Joe, somewhere above me, still climbing up. Pete hasn't claimed her yet. I start to climb faster and wilder. Ah! I hold tight to the tree. I just stepped on a weak branch. I scan the branch for where it cracked when something else catches my eye. Piece of torn fabric, neon blue. I know that color from Eric's t-shirt. This has to be the branch that almost broke when he was climbing. I carefully move to the next branch up. Whoa! (laughs) This tree just caught one more visitor. Climb, climb. Up and down the trees we go. (laughs) I can hear him climbing toward me which means he's also climbing toward Joe. I look up, just in time to see a flash of her boot disappear behind a thatch of leaves. She's way, way above me. I won't be able to get to her in time. Pete's gonna get to her first. But then, a crazy plan starts to form in my head, and before I have time to second guess it, I hear my own voice in the night. Climbing Pete lost his mind, the highest tree he did find. Climbed the highest he could go. Through his eyes, green shoots did grow. I go even louder. Climbed the highest he could go. Through his eyes, green shoots did grow. Climb to me and I'll climb to you. We'll make ourselves at home. Climb, 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 climb. I know I'll only get a few moments before I lose control, before I start to climb higher up the tree, whether or not I want to. But right now, while my body is still mine, I go in the opposite direction, back down to the branch with Eric's shirt. Climbing Pete lost his mind. Step one of the plan was distraction. And it worked. Pete shot right past Joe. I know he's in the branch above me before I even look up. His face is just as horrible as I remember it. But looking Pete face to face isn't going to be the scariest thing I do tonight. I step out onto the branch that almost snapped. And I send up a prayer. Please, let me be right. Maybe there's more to his name than I realized. Maybe climbing Pete can't touch the ground. Come and get me. I'm right here, you ugly piece of chicken shit. Pete lands on my branch. The branch barely quivers. He takes a step toward me and smiles wide. More dark, slithery things crawl out of his mouth. You can stop climbing now. He takes another step closer. Nothing to fear. It will happen quickly. He lunges towards me, and that's when I do it. I jump and land on the branch as hard as I can. 
The branch breaks just as Pete grabs me, and we're eye to eye as we fall. His eyes are big black holes. There's nothing in them, no fear or panic. Even as we hit the ground, Pete takes the brunt of the fall. He's directly underneath me, and it's like landing on a sponge. His body is soft, porous. The forest floor is changing him. He's losing his shape and sinking into the ground. It will happen. I scramble back and watch in silent horror. Pete doesn't fight back. He keeps his eyes on the trees above him. His legs disappear under the earth. His shoulders, his neck, and finally his face. Small white mushroom caps bubble up above him. Centipedes and spiders scurry up from the ground. It's okay. Everything's okay. Stay there, okay? I'm I'm coming to get you. When I go back to the woods three months later, it's January, and a light snow is falling. There are no leaves, just naked branches, and a quiet I've never felt before. I want to come back one last time to say goodbye to Eric. The night that Climbing Pete died, I was able to save six of the seven kids who went into the forest. I got Joe down first, and then we climbed trees and peeled off bark until the sun rose. None of the kids I saved remember any of it, but Joe does. She knows I'm a hero. That's all that matters. I never found Eric, though. I didn't find Campbell, either. I get to the climbing peat tree. I kick away an empty beer bottle and approach the tree with a pair of brand new Converse sneakers. Knowing our town, I'm sure some kid will steal them before the week is over, but I couldn't come here empty-handed. Eric would never forgive me. (laughs) $57.62. You can pay me back when you finally climb down. I set the shoes down at the base of the tree. I'll be graduating soon. I got into my third choice school, a state school. It's a free ride, and with the money I'll make at a local coffee joint, I'll be able to make rent for me and Joe, which is to say I'm taking her with me. I take my time walking back home. The forest doesn't scare me anymore. But right as I get to the edge, I feel like something's watching me. I catch a glimpse of a black figure smaller than climbing Pete's. It swings from tree to tree. But I take my final step out of the forest and I don't look back. Don't worry, Avery got out of the forest alive. But that's because our story's fiction. In the real stories we researched, not everyone was so lucky. One source of inspiration was the tale of Walking Sam from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. From 2014 through 2015, nooses began appearing in fields outside of town, along with the graffiti, Use Them. Some locals claimed it was the work of Walking Sam, a Native American suicide spirit who lures teens into the woods to steal their souls. Once you hear him whistling, it's already too late. He'll lodge himself in your brain. He'll whisper dark thoughts until you go insane. He'll string your soul onto his jacket, where it dangles alongside the hundreds of other souls he's claimed. But he can never have enough. He's always searching for one more soul to add to his collection. 
So the next time you find yourself in the woods, take care. And if someone asks you to chant anything that includes the words climbing peat, run. This is episode three of I Hear Fear, an anthology series of terror narrated and hosted by me, Carrie Mulligan. Starring Luke Padovan, also starring Alexa Victoria Margro, Elan Garfias, Theo Rapp Olson, and Mark Moratini. Additional voicing by Sydney Bell and Don Shea Hopkins. This episode was written by Matt Marinovich. Our senior producer is Natalie Shisha. Our story editors are Janine Cornelo, Loredana Palavoda, and Madison Perry. Our producer is Julie Magruder. Our associate producer is Madison Perry. Our senior managing producer is Ryan Law. And our coordinating producer is Chinwe Obodo. Casting by Rachel Reese of Liz Lewis Casting Partners. Our audio engineer is Sergio Enriquez. Sound design and mix by Jeff Schmidt. Original theme music by Scott Velasquez for Free Son Sync. Executive produced by me, Carrie Mulligan, and by Stephanie Jens and Marshall Louis for one day. Follow I Hear Fear on the Wondery app, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to all episodes early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey on Wondery.com slash survey. I'm about to play a clip from Ghost Story. Follow Ghost Story on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. Have you ever seriously pissed off your in-laws? A couple of years ago, I started investigating a murder in my wife's family. Why would I do something so stupid? Well, partly because I've come to suspect that the woman who was killed is haunting the house I grew up in. There was a weight in the bed like somebody was in it. I woke up because my bed was shaking. So it would be like, shake, 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 shake. But mainly because I think someone in the family might have got away with murder. And my in-laws? Well, they're not exactly thrilled about it. You are deconstructing an age-old story. We're going to be more traumatised by this podcast than we were about the murder, I'll tell you that. There is going to be blowback. I'm Tristan Redman, and from Wandering in Pineapple Street Studios, this is Ghost Story a podcast about the things that come back to haunt us. Binge all episodes of Ghost Story ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts.